from leaving what they've known on Earth to going and living on a different planet uh, or a different moon. Um, we know that the brain uh, stays psychologically healthy when we can orient to our surroundings. So what happens when we put crew on a vehicle and we send them away from Earth where it's no longer even the blue dot, that it, it's, we can't see it and we have no point of reference for anything we've ever known? And I think that can be really disorienting for the brain. So anything we can do to help uh, crew on that kind of a mission feel still connected with the place they call home, as well as then to create a new home and a new home base uh, on Mars and a new community and culture, uh, we want to try to bridge that gap. One thing that we tell crew while they're on station is try not to have one foot on station and one foot on the earth, because it's really hard to be present in both. Uh, it's hard to try to do everything that you and stay involved in everything you would have been on Earth, you know, even with social media and do all the work that they have to do on station. And I think the same will be true for when uh, crews go to Mars, that they're going to want to try to stay connected. But that really long communications delay is going to cause challenges with that. And they'll have to create their own sense of community and connectedness on the new planet uh, to maintain that psychological well-being. <music> Welcome everyone to this new edition of our holographic podcast or holochat. And today uh, my guest is Anna. Anna, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, um, Anna is not only a hologram. She is an operational psychologist. Can you tell me or explain to the audience what an operational psychologist? Yeah. Operational psychologists provide a variety of psychological services to support military, space, and intelligence operations. And we also do assessments and selections and training for personnel in those high-risk positions. Wow. It, it seems like pretty, um, pretty exciting. But I know I do by Anna, but tell the audience, who's uh, Anna? Uh, Dr. Sechka, is that okay? Yeah, Sechka. It's a hard one. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so tell us who you are. Here. Yeah, so uh, I'm Anna Cheka. My background's in clinical health psychology. Uh, originally from Colorado, lived there most of my life before moving to Houston to do this work as an operational psychologist at NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, so it was quite the shift, but I really enjoy what I'm doing now. Yeah, well, now... I mean, what do you do as an operational psychologist at the NASA Johnson Space Center? We're really involved with the lifespan of an astronaut from selection. So we do astronaut selection, um, and there is just an application opening for those of you who are interested in potentially becoming an astronaut. Um, after selection, we do assessment and training. So before astronauts can get their wings, so to speak, they do two years of astronaut candidate training. So we're quite involved in that. Uh, teaching skills like um, self-regulation, emotion regulation, leadership, um, it, other things like um, what we call followership. So that's the ability to follow somebody who's leading and then make make decisions as a leader about who to let lead and when. Uh, we do a lot of operational decision-making training. So in a very dynamic, potentially stressful environment, how do we help these crew members make the best decision to keep everybody safe? And we also train them in effective communication skills, both between uh, each other on a crew and also with uh, ground. And that includes all the kind of secret uh, language to process and communicate very fast in a very efficient way in very short sentences. So clearly it's too long is to communicate that when they do it, do it uh, from space to ground, right? Right, yeah, concise, but also a whole lot of acronyms. It's like its own language. <laughs> Wow, is it? Um, what kind of current ways do you use technology to support astronauts? Well, right now we have crews on the International Space Station, which orbits the Earth at about 250 miles above the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. Uh, so as fast as they're going, uh, they're still separ quite separated from us and uh, their families and their loved ones, as well as their support team here on Earth. So we use technology to help them stay connected with uh, that group of people. So right now they have a telephone that can call down from the International Space Station. 
Uh, there's no phone number to call the space station. They have to call us. Uh, there's also uh, video chat capabilities, so they can video chat down to talk to their families and their friends. Uh, we also use video chat as psychological providers and medical providers to check in and provide any support services that they might need. Yeah, that connection, I believe during uh, the COVID-19, I believe that every one of us, we experienced what was isolation and the effects of just miss that connection with the loved one. Yeah, absolutely. What, um, also, uh, you have been working with uh, technology that we are using today for this interview, which is holographic teleportation, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, as we think about supporting crews and their families for missions that will take us to the moon and Mars, we have to get more creative with how we keep those folks connected. There's a lot of challenges with uh, those missions, particularly as they get longer and further away. In terms of Mars, that's millions of miles away. And so there are communication delays of up to about 44 minutes round trip for a Mars mission. And for lunar missions, it's still uh, an important and, a, and uh, difficult delay of about 10 seconds in some places on the South Pole. So as you can imagine, if you're on a Zoom call and somebody's delayed 10 seconds talking to you, it doesn't feel like a real-time conversation. And certainly for 44 minutes, you can't have a conversation like we'd have in real time. So we're trying to find uh, technologies that can help uh, crew members and families and friends feel connected across that long distance and that communications delay. So a holographic teleportation is one of those ways that we think might help bridge that gap where people can uh, experience each other in 3D even if it's um, you know a store and forward type of situation where I have to send a message of myself in 3D, if we can do that with maybe they might feel like they get to participate in a Thanksgiving dinner or at a family barbecue or a kid's birthday, um, that will help them feel like they're a part of it, uh, even though they're so far away. Yeah. What psychological challenges will astronauts face on future missions to the moon, but also Mars? that technology could address or can head them to their mission? That's a really good question. Uh, like I mentioned with the communications delay, that's a huge one. Uh, and if you've ever been isolated or confined for long periods of time, COVID is a really good uh, parallel example of that, that we now know what it's like to be stuck in a small space for a long period of time and see the same people. It's called social monotony, right? We only have our families, we're missing our friends. We're not able to go out and uh, be in public and astronauts experience the same thing where they're going to be stuck in what is effectively a small room for months to years at a time and uh, not be able to um, get out of that space. And so we try to help them by it, investigating technologies like VR, which might allow them to put on some VR glasses and escape for a bit to maybe their favorite vacation destination. They might have a running trail back home that they miss uh, so they can hop on an exercise machine and put that on and feel like they're right back there. Or it could be their own home and walking through that and seeing family members in that VR space can help them feel that connection to Earth um, as, you know, as they're distant from Earth. Uh, I believe that also another important aspect is the psychological effect of when you are, I believe, on a station for a year or will be on the moon or for a while, you already have instructions and someone tells you what to do every day. But just going back and socialize, uh, I mean, that's that's what we pretty thought of when, right? Yeah, I think that's another great COVID parallel is we all had to figure out how to do relationships again and socialize and be in big groups and... Uh, learn how to be part of uh, community again. And we do the same thing with astronauts. When they return, we work on uh, helping them reintegrate back onto Earth. Uh, it's almost like a reverse culture shock where they're coming back from a very small, isolated, social, socially monotonous space to suddenly lots of sights and sounds and smells and lots of people and things that they haven't been used to. So we work with them on that. And we also work with families on uh, bringing the astronaut back into the family system. And it's almost like, you know, you expect when you leave for a long period of time, you kind of put a bookmark in a book chapter and it's going to be the same way when you get back. And that's not the case. The, the family story is continued. The astronaut story is continued. And they have to figure out how to meld and blend that story where it picks up again and kind of join each other's lives. And that can be complicated and challenging. So to have connection with them 
um, while they're on the station or another vehicle, have connection with their families really helps with that process. I can imagine it's like time travel. It can be um, a different world when they left and a different world when they are coming back. A lot of changes, uh, different politics, different social trends, uh, and it, it's quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Um, let me ask you something, Karen. We, as you know, this is one of the first uh, holographic podcasts, and we are recording you not only of the video, like we, uh, people can watch it on YouTube or Spotify or all the other channels that we use, but also you are recorded as a hologram. So I believe that people will be able to watch this in a holographic way, not only today, but on all, also in 20, 30 years from now, which is interesting. They can be able to play you uh, as a hologram. And this is my first interview with an operational psychologist, if that's right. Um, what, what do you want to say to people watching this in 20 or 30 years from now? Hmm. That's a good question. My hope is that in 20 years, we'll have gone to the moon and back to Mars, or back to moon and to Mars, and uh, that we can help people continue to uh, explore deep space and um, have that exploration spirit. Um, I that manifest destiny that we have as humans of wanting to get out there and find what's there and learn more about our origin story as humans. And um, I think that better connects us with as humanity on Earth. And my hope is that even as we explore, we continue to find ways to uh, connect better uh, and care for each other better here on Earth uh, to make whatever communities we form on the moon and Mars that much better. Wow. Well, um, it has been a very good interview. Um, time really flies, but something that I want to ask, but we still have time. Is there some, I, my background is not in psychology. Um, and you literally as a genius, a very humble one. You will not accept that, but you have a lot of research and uh, you already published a lot of stuff before coming to NASA and after that. Is there something that you want to talk that you want to include in this podcast that will be visible not only for this generation, but also for future generations? It's hard to pick out of all those things, just one thing. Pick more than one. Pick, <laughs> pick more than one. Hmm. I think, uh, you know, one thing that I found really interesting coming from uh, the work that I did prior to this and then coming to NASA was discovering that working at NASA means you can have really any background. And I think that so many kids and aspiring uh, astronauts think that you have to come from just science or math or technology to work at NASA. But the truth is we have artists and videographers and people in public relations and uh, so many different backgrounds that if you want a job in space, there's a place for that. Uh, especially as the as space uh, exploration is expanding to commercial partners, there's so many different ways to get involved. And we love to encourage uh, everyone, but particularly uh, young girls and minorities, uh, to look into that and participate more in uh, this this um, this exploration and and the work that we're doing. One final question: So we are becoming an interplanetary species. At some point, we 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 have people on Mars and maybe other planets. What? will be the psychological challenges for you and for your people when the gravity is going to be different, the conditions are going to be different. The first generation of babies uh, born and raised on another planet is going to be different from ours in, in some way. What are the challenges that you will face with that new generation of extraterrestrial humans? That's a phenomenal question. I think the biggest answer is we really don't know. Um, we don't know uh, what it looks like for the human brain and development when you pull humans away from any environment that we evolved in. So we 
evolved on this planet to be in this environment with this community and this gravity and this air and this magnetic field. And we don't know what happens when we pull people away, people pull humans away from anything they've ever known. Um, and particularly for the people who are bridging that gap from leaving what they've known on Earth to going and living on a different planet uh, or a different moon, um, we know that the brain uh, stays psychologically healthy when we can orient to our surroundings. So what happens when we put crew on a vehicle and we send them away from Earth where it's no longer even the blue dot, that it, it's, we can't see it and we have no point of reference for anything we've ever known? And I think that can be really disorienting for the brain. So anything we can do to help uh, crew on that kind of a mission feel still connected with the place they call home, as well as then to create a new home and a new home base uh, on Mars and a new community and culture, uh, we want to try to bridge that gap. One thing that we tell crew while they're on station is try not to have one foot on station and one foot on the earth because it's really hard to be present in both. Uh, it's hard to try to do everything that you and stay involved in everything you would have been on earth, you know, even with social media and do all the work that they have to do on station. And I think the same will be true for when uh, crews go to Mars, that they're going to want to try to stay connected. But that really long communications delay is going to cause challenges with that. And they'll have to create their own sense of community and connectedness on the new planet uh, to maintain that psychological well-being. Wow. My mind is flying. And thank you so much for this interview. And all the people watching this, don't forget to hit the button, subscribe. Uh, we, we are trying to have a new episode every week. But Anna, it's always a pleasure. And hopefully we can, we can repeat this interview in the future. You have so many topics. Uh, you have been working on so many projects. And 20 minutes is not good enough <laughs> to try to capture at least 1% of that. But thank you so much for joining me as my guest. And all of you, thank you for watching.